Our next talk before the break uh, is going to come from Professor Chris Love, uh, who uh, is the Latham uh, Family Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering. He's a faculty member in the Koch Institute and also an associate member of the Broad Institute and the Reagan Institute of MGH, MIT, and Harvard. And as uh, Tyler mentioned in his opening remarks, um, we're trying to highlight in, in the talks today both the clinical and basic science in immunology and also some uh, novel engineering approaches that are being applied in, in immunology and cancer immunotherapy. And Chris is going to highlight some of the approaches being developed in his lab for developing new ways to analyze and measure what's going on with the immune system. Thank you and good morning. Let's take a look at how you can use ideas from process engineering in combination with advances in microtechnologies to enhance the breadth and resolution of single cell measurements of immune responses. In particular, I'd like to take the next 25 to 30 minutes to talk about three ideas. First, I'd like to introduce you to a modular array-based platform that we've developed over the last few years to enable multiple measurements on single immune cells. We'll call this integrated single cell analysis. The second idea, I'd like to look at some surprising results that come from analyzing the time-resolved functional responses of T cells using this technology. We'll call that cytokine trajectories. And then the third idea that I'd like to, to think about today is a different mode of operation of the platform that allows us to look how NK cells interact in a functionally heterogeneous way with tumor cells and discrete co-cultures. So three ideas, integrated single cell analysis, cytokine trajectories, and discrete co-cultures. Now, as an engineer, you think about the challenge of immunotherapies or interventions broadly, and it looks something like this transfer function. You have an input, it can be your favorite anti-PD-1 antibody, it could be a vaccine, it could be an engineered T cell, and it goes into the human body, and we're looking for a positive outcome. We're looking for protection, uh, resolution of disease, uh, therapeutic action. But standing in the middle of all of this, and what we have to try to understand how well that is working, aside from the clinical outcome, is the immune system. Now, the immune system, as we appreciate it, is comprised of many different compartments of hematopoietic-derived cells that interact together in a dis dispersed network uh, through a number of different means, both cell-cell contact as well as secreted factors like cytokines, and that this is a very dense network. The network I've shown you here it represents roughly some of the connectivities of different cytokines within it, but it's much more dense than this. In fact, it's a thought that the density of the immune network is on the order of that of social networks like Facebook or Twitter. So if you think about it, this is a really challenging problem to understand how do we monitor what's happening at a mechanistic level of the biology of the disease as well as the interventions that we want to use. Now, many of you that work in this area are probably familiar with the approach that is typically taken. You get a clinical biopsy of some kind. This could be a blood sample, least invasive. It could be a tissue sample. It could be a fluid. And in that, there are cells from the immune system that you want to make measurements on. And so you make decisions about what kinds of assays you're going to run. You might run a flow cytometry assay to figure out what kinds of cells you have in that, in that compartment. You might do other functional measurements uh, so look for what kind of proteins they might make. And finally, you might do genomic analysis. And you might do this on small subsets of populations if you have uh, enough cells to use your flow sorter to, to pull those out or bead-based selection. But what happens when you have this fine needle aspirate that has 1,000 cells in it? Which of those measurements are you going to make? Analytical technologies today are largely biased towards having more than enough cells present to be able to make the measurements that you'd like. What happens when there's a rare cell, say uh, an autoreactive T cell, or in this context, perhaps a, an effective engineered T cell to engage with the tumor? How can you make measurements on it when it's derived from this very small biopsy sample that you have? And physically, at some level, when you only have a certain number of cells, it gets partitioned into one of these measurements or the other. And so you might ask yourself, what does a chemical engineer have to tell me about making a measurements in the immune system? 
And what does chemical engineering broadly have to say? Because when you think about chemical engineering, you probably think about this picture. This is an oil refinery. Now, one of the important things that chemical engineering did for chemistry more than 100 years ago was to develop the idea that you could create common operations based on basic physical and chemical principles that you could put together in a variety of different processes to take a high value input, say crude oil in this case, and convert that into a number of high value products. Examples here would be fuel, asphalt, coke, the, the useful kind. I can take those same operations and reconfigure this to build a, a shampoo plant or a polymer plant. So there's modular operations that can be put together in a multi-stage process to ask a complex question or carry out a complex process. So we want to do the same thing now, but to do this for measurements of the immune system as it relates to monitoring how cells respond to therapies, treatments, vaccines, disease condition. So in this instance, what we would like to be able to do is be more conservative with the sample that we receive, to recognize that this is a precious sample and that there's material here that we want to maximize the information that we can get out of it. And so we're going to build a technology to allow us to isolate cells from that so that we can conservatively keep them there. And then we're going to build operations around that that we can put together in a custom process. One instance might be to ask, you know, are there exhausted T cells in the tumor and what kind of cytokine responses are associated with that? I'd do phenotyping, I'd look at secretions. I might do this over time. A second question might be to ask, you know, how does tumor cells respond to a particular drug treatment? Which ones survive? And what are the genetic factors that, uh, that, that confer that resistance? So in this way, we want to be able to build a modular system that lets us answer each of those questions in, in a way that we can reconfigure as needed. Now, the approach that we've taken to thinking about this is a very simple one. There are a lot of advances in, in the area of microfluidics in a number of areas over the last several years that have enabled the ability to position cells into small containers and define volumes that are manufactured in, by many of the same kinds of technologies that are used in uh, the semiconductor industry to manufacture uh, silicon chips. We're using the same idea here to create an array of sub-nanoliter wells that, on average, on a plate like this, has about 1,000 equivalents of a 96-well plate. So each of the squares that you can begin to see by eye on the image on the left is an array of about a half of a 96-well plate. And there's about 85,000 containers on this, this array. And the reason that we've chosen this is this is a very simple format to work with. This now becomes the substrate on which we can put our clinical sample. And cells will settle into this at about one cell per well. It's governed by a Poisson distribution. So on a chip like this one with 85,000, we'd get about 30,000 single cell events as well as some higher order uh, occupancies, as well as control events where there's no cells loaded. And what we can do is to tune, based on the sample that we have and the questions that we're interested in, where this occupancy lies and the number of events that are there. And as I'll show you later, there's actually some opportunities to think about how you can use these kind of multi-filled uh, wells as well uh, to, to give you some new insights into functional responses. Now, what kinds of operations can we perform? Well, the simplest one is to take their picture. Most people are familiar with imaging um, microscopes. Most people are probably familiar with flow cytometers. So flow cytometers measure multiple different surface markers on immune cells that flow past a laser that uh, amplifies the signal and is read out on a photomultiplier tube. Here we're going to do the same thing, but you're going to use a, uh, a microscope to image the array. As it, as it rasters around, it takes pictures of each well uh, in these blocks, and on this image you can see a block of 49 wells. It's like the zip code on the block, on the array. And each of the little containers in there is like the specific street address. And so we're going to map out by census where everybody lives. You can see then the occupancy of the wells. You can see surface markers. You can look at, at interactions here. We can now do this for 12 colors on the microscope. We can do this uh, through methods that allow us to uh, deconvolute spectral overlap between different adjacent markers. And so what you can do on a microscope now is very comparable to what you can do by a state-of-the-art uh, flow cytometer. Some things that you'll notice here in, in these data, you know, the CD56 and the 16 positive population, this is the NK cell population from this peripheral blood sample, uh, particularly in, of, of you know, interest here if you're a flow cytometrist, is the ability to resolve the bright and dim populations 
uh, in the NK cell set. And for the aficionados, these are FMO uh, dependent uh, measurements here. You can see CD25, you can see a number of other uh, continuous markers in this way in which we can now resolve this. So on a microscope with you know, literally a thousand cells, you can do 12 color cytometry on, on these on these cells. And to show you an example of that, here's now looking at cytobrush samples that were taken from the female uh, reproductive tract of, of, uh, of healthy individuals in a matched blood sample where we used the phenotyping panel here to look at what kinds of populations that are there. Some interesting things to note, just even in healthy subjects, comparing now mucosal tissue immunology to blood-based immunology, that the CD8 C cells are more abundant in the Cytobrushes than, uh, than the CD4 population. NK cells are more prevalent in these mucosal regions than uh, in blood, and B cells are diminished. So you can start to really get a fine sampling of what's there with very limited material. Imagine doing this with the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes from a, from, from a colon biopsy. Now, a second kind of measurement that you can make is to think about looking at function. And one kind of function that's of particular importance in immune cells, of course, is to look at the secreted factors that they produce. And you can do this in a way that, that uh, borrows some ideas from Albrecht Dürer. Now, Albrecht Dürer was an artist in the late 15th, early 16th century that developed an idea known as intaglio printing. It uses an engraved plate in which you carve out the features of the art that you're interested in. And then you apply an ink to that surface and you wipe it clean. The ink sits in the recesses of the engraved plate, and then you can take that with a little bit of pressure and apply it against a piece of paper. The, trans the print will transfer, and then you're left with a replicate. I think this was a way for him to replicate something that took a long time to make, many times over, to sell to many other people. Uh, this method of intaglio printing we're going to borrow here to make measurements on single cells from the immune system. But now, instead of applying an ink, we're going to allow the cells to provide their own ink. We're going to take that array that's loaded with cells, and we're going to put on top of it a glass slide that's coated with a uniform layer of capture antibodies against uh, a number of different analytes that we're interested in. You can multiplex this uh, currently up to four or five different analytes um, per, per assay. And we're going to put it in contact for you know, 30 minutes, an hour, uh, up to two hours, uh, and make measurements on what the cells secrete over that period of time. Afterwards, we're going to separate the two plates, and on the one hand, we're going to have a protein microarray that's like any other immunoassay. We can come in with antibodies that are fluorescently labeled uh, against the targets that we've, that we've captured and stain for those. And then on the other hand, we have the cells themselves. This is non-destructive. They're still there. And so we can use that spatial information about zip codes and street addresses to map out the relationship between the secreted factors we've captured as well as the, the cells that we're producing them. And to show you an example of this, uh, this is just a simple example using human T cells that are viable where we stimulate them. We can do this in bulk or we can do it on chip. We can do both, uh, both formats here. Place them in the array, and then what you're looking at are individual human T cells uh, secreting different, in this case, four different uh, cytokines that are indicative of a variety of different TH states. And I think what's important is, is that you can now do on viable T cells polyfunctional measurements. So you can look at multiple cytokines from cells that don't require fixation uh, and, and uh, loss of the, the viability of the cell. Secondly, it can be quantitative. So we've demonstrated through understanding the mass transport of the analytes in the system that we can get measurements of the rates of secretion. This gives us another dimensionality to the data. So in an ELI spot that you might be familiar with as a clinical assay, you can count how many cells are responding. But in this instance, you can look at the actual distribution and in, in the rates of response, and you can compare that among different cytokines and under different treatments. This extra dimensionality is interesting as another way to resolve uh, actual positive responses to uh, antigen, for example. It's non-destructive. We can go back to individual locations and by micromanipulation recover cells and clone them out. We've shown that for antigen-specific responses that we can get back uh, T cells uh, from HIV-infected patients with a cloning efficiency that's comparable to that that you do by flow cytometry on the order of 80 to 90 percent. And that this recovery allows you then, of course, to do additional measurements on those clones that you've generated, including sequencing TCRs. And then finally, we've looked at a number of different ways to make this approach antigen-specific. Uh, one, one method is to simply adsorb onto the array uh, either uh, MHC class 1 loaded with peptides directly, or you can use uh, 
uh, antigen loaded into MHC class one, immobilized on fluid lipid bilayers with co-stimulatory molecules. So it gives you an opportunity to look at the synapse structure of the cell as it interacts and relate that to the function uh, that, that results, either cytokine release or proliferation. So in this first part of the talk, I've shown you this platform, and I've only shown you a few of the capabilities of what's possible. I won't have time today to tell you about some of the other operations that we've put together, but the point is, is that this simple substrate allows us to put cells from very small clinical samples into places where we know where they are, and we can make multiple measurements on them, and that we can reconfigure and look at those measurements both as a function of time and uh, activity. Now, a lot of you, if you're from Boston, you might have watched the first game of the Stanley Cups the other night and disappointingly saw the Bruins lose. If you just woke up the next day and you looked at a picture of that, you might not have felt the same tension and agony that the rest of us did in watching that game. You understand that the game itself is very dynamic, and that snapshot that you look at does not capture the kind of intimacy that you have with the game and watching it live. This is how we measure immune responses, though. Typically, we take a snapshot, we look by flow cytometry, and we measure what's happening. What I'd like to do in the last part of the talk is to talk about two examples where you can now look at the dynamics of responses of individual cells as they become activated. And I'm going to make the point that I think that these are important ways in which we can now start to classify cells, as well as start to resolve differences in complex functional behaviors. Now, T cells are typically differentiated by subsetting and flow cytometry by surface markers, CCR7, CD45RA, uh, many others. You can debate this with T cell immunologists most of the day, actually. It's known, though, that you have naive cells that have never encountered antigen. They have certain surface markers. They see antigen. They progress in memory stages and to effector stages in a, in a variety of different ways. There's a few different mechanisms that are proposed, but typically the kinds of linear mechanisms shown here. But if you notice in each of these, the cytokines that are associated with that are kind of, kind of grouped on there in a, in, a, in a kind of rough, approximate way, looking at, in this case, Th1 cytokines like TNF, interferon, IL-2. There's been a hard time associating particular functions with the differentiated subset of T cells. So what I'd like to make an argument for is that actually it's not that the signature is whether it makes these three, but rather how it makes these three. So if you're a T cell, you could make cytokines and release them into your environment in a variety of different ways. And I've shown here a cartoon of three different cytokines that are being released over time. If you do a typical measurement by integrated uh, intracellular cytokine staining on a flow cytometer, you integrate information over a six-hour window. And so you can say, yes, it made three, but you lose information about that timing. What you'd kind of like to do instead is actually look at how these cells respond as a function of time, much like watching the hockey game and trying to understand you know, what, what the interactions among the players might be, what their functions are. So we decided to devise a process where we could take human CD3-positive T cells, array them onto the nanowells, and then image them to look at the differentiated subset based on CCR7, CD45RA expression levels, to classify these as different subsets. And then uh, during activation, through both TCR-dependent and independent mechanisms, we sample what the cells are making right now. And so in this way, we get about 30 parameters of data for each cell that tells us about the differentiated subset among CD8, CD4 populations, whether it's alive or dead at the beginning and the end, whether it's single cell or not, and then trajectory information about how these cytokines respond. If you start to aggregate these data for thousands of cells under these different stimulation conditions, you start to notice some things in how these cells are responding to these perturbations. Shown here are heat maps where each line represents a single cell and its response over time to two different kinds of stimuli here, PMA anomycin, which is a TCR-independent mechanism of activation, and a TCR-dependent mechanism through CD3, CD28 activation. And what you notice is that actually most of these cells are going through what seem to be kind of particular trajectories. But there's a randomness to when they actually start. Each of these cells sees the same stimulation from the same time, but yet you can see at each of these time points there are unique cells that are beginning to secrete into their environment. 
So there's a randomness to that, that initiation point. But once they do that, they seem to kind of go through these kind of common trajectories. The other thing you notice is that there's not much white on here. So this is in the RGB color space, and white represents the combination of all three cytokines being released at the same time. These highly polyfunctional states are quite rare in this temporally resolved data set. That's not to say that cells don't make multiple cytokines. You can certainly see instances here where there are blue resolving to red or blue resolving to green. If you take this and you analyze these kinds of data and you look at uh, the kinds of trajectories that are present there, there's really only a small subset of data that represents 90 to 95% of the variation. That is, out of the 65,000 possible combinations of data here, there's really only like 8 to 12 subsets that are used predominantly in this population, suggesting that once you become activated, there's actually a programmatic trajectory to this. More interestingly is that those trajectories associate with particular classes of cells. Memory cells, either effector or central, have access to more states than naive and effector. And this is consistent with what we now know in, in some regards related to memory responses and sustained memory responses relating to chromatin remodeling. Uh, Thomas Hofer's lab in Germany has done some very nice work in that space that would, that would be consistent with this kind of argument that more functional states would be accessible by memory cells. If we go further with some computational analyses, we can, we can look at the data set and we can ask, are there particular combinations of data that would describe the differentiated subsets? And we can train a model, and then we can take another part of the data and we can map it on and ask, how well do you do at predicting that based on that, that modeled state? And we do this thousands of times. What you see here in the heat map is the, the called pr projection from the true subtype that we get based on the differentiated surface markers and what we see just from the kinetic uh, traces themselves. If we had perfect prediction, it would be exactly on the diagonal. You see we do a pretty, pretty good job at making the prediction. There's some, uh, there's some uncertainty around the memory population, perhaps suggesting that it's context dependent whether your memory effector or central where you are as opposed to what you can do. But if we take the same data and we compress it down as if it was integrated information from uh, flow cytometry, we lose all of that resolution. We can no longer predict the type of T cell based on that functional trace. And then I also told you there's this randomness to when cells start. If we take that component out, we do even better at predicting it. So it suggests that these kinetic trajectories associate very closely with the type of T cell. And so this would explain in part why it's been hard to assign functions to a particular subset of T cells, because there's kinetic information that's lost in conventional measures. So to summarize this section on cytokine trajectories, T cells exhibit temporally dynamic patterns of cytokine release under persistent stimulation. The polyfunctionality itself is not a fixed state. We talk a lot about polyfunctionality and positive responses and immune responses, but this is not a fixed state, it's, it's evolving. And then finally, the dynamic trajectories do not appear to be random. They seem to be a finite set, and there's some program behind it. We don't understand the mechanism today, but uh, it's very interesting to, uh, to begin to understand how programs get called. All right, so in the third part of the talk, I'd like to finish with an example in looking at how NK cells respond to tumor cells. Now, NK cells are another subset of the immune system. They express both uh, inhibitory receptors and stimulatory receptors in kind of odd combinations. They're a very diverse population of cells for those that, that look at this group. And under homeostatic conditions, they engage MHC class one molecules and other stimulatory ligands on the, on the cells and confer no action. But oftentimes in transformation in tumors, you lose HLA expression. And in that instance, NK cells can engage and either perform cytolytic activities on that tumor cell or release cytokines into the environment. So we wanted to try to understand this phenomenon a little bit more as it related to the functional heterogeneities in these populations. So to do this, we took NK cells and now co-loaded them with tumor cells, in this case, a, a myelogenous leukemia line that's deficient in class one, in a way that we can now monitor by nuclear uptake of a, of a, of a dye upon permeabilization, cytox, for cytolytic activity. What you can see in the movie here is that the cells move around in these little environments and they sample the cells and then ultimately, in this instance, you can see it turn green as it, as it kills uh, that particular tumor cell. This agrees nicely with what you measure by flow cytometry, by surrogate measures of cytolytic activity, things like degranulation markers, CD107A, under a variety of different stimulation conditions. Now, when we load these chips, the, the cells go everywhere. 
And so we get all sorts of different combinations of cells on the array. We get single in K cells, single targets. These are great controls. We get one on one. We get all the other combinations. And we do so in tens to thousands of each of these different combinations. And so this allows us now to look now as a function of configuration what's happening in these systems. So as an example, individual NK cells that are in wells with targets will sample around in their environment. And for the most part, they will sample effi efficiently. They'll look at most of the target cells that are in their wells uh, and sample at least one cell uh, that's in their environment. And if we ask then what's the timing before uh, cytolysis occurs, it happens very fast. So NK cells are primed and loaded uh, in, in, these, in these experiments to be able to effectively carry out cytolysis when, within about 24 minutes and a median. But you can see here that there's much heterogeneity in the response. Some of these out to 200 minutes before the first kill is enabled. We can also ask questions because we have these configurations about the serial killing. And it turns out that most NK cells kill the first target that they hit. You don't want to be that guy. But after that, you have a pretty high survival rate uh, if, if, if you're a tumor cell and get engaged. It takes time for these cells to then reload, it seems, uh, to be able to respond. And then we can start to associate this with other kinds of measurements. So I showed you the microengraving. We can combine the cytolysis assay and secretion assays, and we can start to resolve finer phenotypes in the functions. Here, in case cells shown are a bunch of different tracks in space where they kind of roam around their wells. If they make contact, but they do not secrete interferon gamma, they remain much more mobile. They're likely to secrete MIP1 beta and to perform lysis, but they, they, they seem to move around a lot. Whereas cells that are predominantly secreting interferon gamma get a much stronger arrest signal, suggesting that there's actually distinct functional phenotypes in these populations. It'd be an interesting question to understand what uh, inhibitory and, and stimulatory receptors that these cells express. And then finally, a kind of question that you can only ask in these discrete co-cultures is thinking about cooperativity. That is, do multiple cells work together to target a single tumor cell? We can do this by looking at cytolysis under each of these different states. So if we measure what the rate of killing is for a single target with a single NK cell, under an independence hypothesis, we can predict what the rate should be for other ones. And if we do this, we can then calculate what that predicted trend should look like. And if the data hold, then we would say that these behave in an independent manner. If they acted cooperatively, there would be a, 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 a synergistic response that we would measure in these arrays. The only way you can get at this question is to have these discrete co-cultures where you can really understand the numbers and occupancies to be able to make these kinds of probabilistic models. And what we can see, just to cut a long story short and to, to, to wrap up here, is that NK cells do act independently in these instances. Regardless of stimulation condition, uh, they do seem to just act like their own little noisy operators. They sample their environment, and they respond in their own ways. This says nothing about whether they call their friends in from long distance or other, other kinds of interactions. But in the heat of the moment, when they're looking for this target and they're engaged, they act independently. We can say that from other work we've done in tumor microenvironments, this isn't necessarily true for things like secretory behaviors uh, of things like growth factors. So it's an interesting way to now think about how to make measurements of small communities. So I'll just conclude here in the last minute to tell you that in the nanowell-based analyses that I've shown you, we can now enable really customized, integrated measurements that have complex functions as a part of it. This really, because of the way that it's developed using these microtechnologies, we can look at very, very limited samples. We look commonly now at cytobrush samples, tissue biopsies, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, a variety of different small volume samples. You can do temporal and quantitative measurements with this type of approach. And that there's new classes of measurements that you wouldn't envision otherwise. And finally, just to conclude with some thoughts about implications for hum human immune monitoring. We see that single cells are noisy operators. It's good to measure single cells. You want to understand how they respond, but you need to understand the breadth and distribution of that response. Uh, any individual is not necessarily reflective of the bulk phenotype. The landscape of functional activity, as I've shown you, is much more complex than what we understand from integrated measures. So including cytoff and intracellular staining, you can look at a variety of different states, but there's a dynamicism that's lost in that. And then finally, we think these time resolved measures offer a fine resolution into how to improve monitoring uh, to perturbative signals. So I'll, I'll thank you for, for the time. I appreciate that there is now a break. Uh, I'll just finish by thanking uh, the folks involved in the work. In particular, uh, the NK cell work was, and, and cytolytic assays were developed by Yvonne Yamanaka and, pr and a prior postdoc, Naveen Baradarjan, in collaboration with Gleed Alters Lab. Uh, the 
T-cell story that I told you was developed by Chen Han and a computational biologist, Neto Bagheri, from Doug Laufenberger's lab, also uh, an extramural member of the KI. And then, uh, of course, these, uh, the, the cytometry has been developed by Todd Guerin and Aicha Ozkumar. And all of this has been done with a number of different clinical collaborators, including particularly David Hafler's lab at Yale. So I uh, thank you for your time and your attention, and 